Welcome to the Assemblage Down Street. Just a quick word about where you are and what this is. This is a co-working, co-living space. This is the second of what will be three buildings. There's one on Park Avenue and 25th Street, and another one opening on Park Avenue next year. We're dedicating to help people's mission go higher in their missions. We support that with Ayurvedic food, daily wellness programming like meditation, yoga, and special events like this one. And now without further ado, we'd like to welcome Alan. This is J Just One is his name. Just One. Just One. That's, that means there's only one. But, <laughs> and I'll be talking today to Dr. David Hanskin back in control. But before we, I do that, I just want to say this place, the assemblage, is a hub of spiritual conscious activity in New York. It's really hard to change the social landscape of the city because there's so much going on. But if you're a member here, if you're associated with this place, you gain a wealth of information. You gain a workspace, uh, uh, networking with other people, and um, it's just a miracle that has shown up in New York here. So there's a place here down on John Street, and there's one over at um, 25th Street. So I recommend this. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's changed my social habits. So thank you all for being here. My name's Alan Steinfeld, and I do... Um, I do a cable show, I do a YouTube channel called New Realities, and it's always great to do things here. And what's so important about tonight is that Dr. David Hanskin is a back surgeon, and we'll get into it, and he tells people not to have surgery. I mean, basically, he's putting himself out of business. I think he's actually retired. <laughs> is, that what, is that true? Um, I'm David Hanscom. I yes. am an orthopedic spine surgeon. I've been practicing for over 32 years. And the last 10 years have been rather awkward for me because my conversion rate of surgery, if 100 patients come to my office, historically between 20 to 40 percent of people go on to surgery, my conversion rate is 4.6 percent. The conversion rate? To surgery. To surgery. Is 4.6 percent. And it's not because people aren't getting better, they're simply getting better without the surgery. Right. And that's something you don't hear many back surgeons telling or... or we're talking about, and he, well, we'll go into what is pain and the cure, the remedy, the substitute for surgery that you've come up with. So let's start with um, what is pain. When, when people have uh, come into you, they, they're in pain. They have uh, pain in their spine or anywhere, and what happens next? Well, I'm one of those surgeons who's been on both sides of this fence. Uh -huh. So I spent my first eight years in practice thinking that surgery was the answer for pain. Right. Everything else had been tried, and it's sort of a cultural thing that with this physical therapy, primary care, patients think, well, everything else has been tried. Let's try surgery because it's definitive. Well, like anything, if you can't see it, you can't really fix it. So if you go to the dentist with a cavity and get it fixed, it works well. Mm -hmm. If you go to the dentist with mouth pain and start doing procedures, it doesn't work very well. So people come to you, but they, have, they look at their x-rays and there's a bulge in their spine. They're feeling pain in their back somewhere. And that's, that's something visual, right? That no. It's not. No, that's the problem is that okay. th with back pain, it's just a symptom. And the data now shows that less than 5% of the time do we actually know where back pain comes from. So it doesn't come from a bulging disc or a sprain. It, it, that's what you're saying? does not. It does not, because you have 30 years of experience to prove that. Well, it, interestingly enough, in the 90s, the research was very clear that disc degeneration, arthritis, ruptured disc, herniated disc, bulging disc actually don't cause back pain. We know that. We actually know that disc degeneration doesn't cause back pain. It doesn't? Does not. It causes something though, right? Does, it causes a stiffer spine. Okay. But I'm not as flexible as I am. So I'm what, let's get to the root of it. What causes pain and back pain then? So first of all, I'm a spine surgeon, but this is for multiple different types of pain. So it doesn't matter what body parts you're dealing with. Migraine headaches, irritable bowel, spastic bladder, back pain, neck pain, foot pain, PTSD, fibromyalgia. All of these go to the same part of the brain and they create an unpleasant sensation that we call anxiety. Sensation creates anxiety. The, the chemical surge, so if you have a threat, uh -huh. whether it's a physical threat, so let's go back one more step. 
every living creature survives by avoiding threats. That's right. I try to do that myself. <laughs> okay. and, and same thing with humans. You have a, if you have a physical threat, and if you don't pay attention to the signals, you don't survive. Right. So it turns out that the most anxious species are the ones that survived, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's so critical is that a physical threat creates a tight muscles, it creates adrenaline, cortisol, histamines. Mm -hmm. So you get this chemical surge mm -hmm. that says take protective action. So you get, an, you get an uncomfortable sensation that we call anxiety. Right. So anxiety is that uncomfortable sensation created by this neurochemical response to a threat. Humans have a major problem is that thoughts and concepts create the same reaction. You could think about someone being stuck in traffic or being late and that will create the same cortisol reactions in the body, anxiety in the body. Correct. The neuroscience has become quite clear on this. The research term is called URTs, unpleasant repetitive thoughts. So whether you suffer with your thoughts or suppress them or mask them, humans can't escape their thoughts. And this is universal. Everybody has anxiety. Everybody spends a tremendous amount of energy pretending that they don't have anxiety. So the anxiety converts to a physical sensation how and when? Immediately. In other words, your automatic response, if you're, again, let's go to the physical threat first. If somebody threatens you with a, gu threatens you with a gun, mm -hmm. Your body's going to tighten up, tension, and bam, you're out of there. Right. Okay. Thoughts, somebody cuts you off in traffic, or somebody hurts your feelings, or you have an unpleasant boss, et cetera, you get these obsessive thought patterns occurring that you can't stop. And the work, what we all do, we suppress them. We try to suppress our thoughts, and guess what? The research shows we make them much worse. There's a trampoline effect. So you don't think about it, it's going to keep coming up and get to go deeper into the body is what you're saying, right? Correct. So the reason why the mental threats are so critical is because it, translate, it, it translates into a chemical response that's sustained, so it translates into physical symptoms. So there's, all, there's over 30 physical symptoms created by this, this sustained mental unpleasant input. Oh, so the, the body will take those anxieties and translate into something physical, like what are some of the 30 symptoms that you've discovered? So I went into chronic pain myself for 15 solid years. I had 16 of these 30 symptoms. I had no idea what hit me. So I had migraine headaches, ringing in my ears, stomach issues, neck pain, back pain. I had burning sensations in my feet. My scalp was itching. I developed severe insomnia, anxiety. It did, the list is 16 of them long. But this was all from anxiety that you suppressed. Emotionally. Right. The one thing I didn't have until 38 years old was anxiety. I had, all, I had all these physical symptoms, but I actually didn't know what anxiety was. I see. Okay. Because, I, I, I mean, my, we talked about earlier, I'm a spine surgeon. I'm a major complex spine surgeon. The training I had was, was considered one of the top fellowships in the world at the time in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And my attitude was bring it on. My personal self-image was bring it on. I can take on anything. And I did. I was great. I was pretty good at that. You were, but you didn't help people because you said surgery doesn't help, but it did help, or no? Well, it took me, so my first eight years in practice, I did lots of fusions for back pain. And it's still done all over the world. What yes. is that? So people come in with back, back pain, pain, and then you did what for them? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So I came in, into an era where the treatment of choice for back pain is if everything else had failed, you would weld the spine together, literally uh -huh. fuse them together with screws and plates and rods, uh -huh. and this, this quote disc, which has now been documented not to be a source of pain, mm -hmm. was fused, and I thought I was, I was a zealot. I mean, I was on fire with this operation. But did it help people when you did that? No. It did not? I, it took me seven years. I, so I asked, my partner, I asked my partner one day, well, what's the data on this operation? And he goes, I don't know. So the data came out in 1993 that the success rate of a spine fusion in a worker's comp patient in the state of Washington was 22%. Mm -hmm. And I stopped. So in 1993, I stopped doing fusions for back pain. Meanwhile, I plunged off a cliff into my own chronic pain. Right. And it started with a panic attack on a bridge at 10 o'clock at night. 
So I went from no anxiety to panic attacks. Once that hit, it was 15 solid years of hell. It was miserable. I had no hope. I had no idea what hit me. I went to every doctor you can imagine. I did everything. And nobody could tell me what happened. But this was because you had suppressed the, the symptom, whatever it was in your life, for so long that, boom, it came up and smacked you in the face. So Correct. Okay. Yep. I was, I was absolutely a master of suppressing stress. I mean, I, again, I became a major, major spine surgeon by just bring it on. And none of us like to feel anxious, so we don't. So I think probably the most common way we deal with anxiety we just, we, is we just suppress it. The problem why it's so critical in the anxiety thing, remember, it's not primarily psychological. So you have physical or mental threats mm -hmm. that, give you a chemi you, that give you a chemical response that gives you an uncomfortable sensation that makes you want to protect yourself, right? It's, so anxiety is that chemical surge. The reason, the reason why that's so critical is that that unconscious survival response is one million times greater than the conscious brain. Oh, yeah, he told me this. Uh, the, the subconscious is one million times stronger than the conscious mind. So if you have something going on subconsciously and you're trying to overcome it with your will, your subconscious mind will, will get the best of you every time until you make the subconscious conscious, which was what you were doing with, by feeling the anxiety. Think just for a second. Right now you're sitting there. I'm talking. I'm not calculating how my muscles in my mouth are supposed to move. I'm unconsciously shifting my seat so I don't get, so I don't get sores on my, on my rear end from skin sores. Um, I'm a, my pupils are constricting because that light's a little bit bright right now. So there are millions of functions per second that will allow us to survive as part of the unconscious brain. So it's, it's all regulated by neurochemical response to sensory input. So this unconscious reaction is incredibly powerful and our consciousness, again, hit us about, it hit Homo sapiens about 70,000 years ago compared to millions of years of existence. So we have this small psyche or the consciousness that's trying to deal with this massive survival response. It's a complete mismatch. And we're trying to treat anxiety as a conscious phenomenon. The problem is if you want to talk about it, where's your attention? In other words, we know the brain changes by the second. If you want to discuss your troubles, you want to discuss your anxiety, I tell my patients, you must have put your hand right into a hornet's nest. You're, you're actually stirring up the trouble that's causing the situation in the first place. So you can't solve it. But that's what you want to do. You want to put your hands into the nest so you can get to the bottom of it, right? I mean, that's, that's all we know what to do. But that was your, so talk a little bit about your journey. So you woke up one day, it just hit you, and then, you know, this is all the result of his book, Back in Control, is, and had a, you know, go overcome your pain was your journey in a sense and what you discovered so what did you how did you deal with that all those 16 symptoms that you came down with so first of all let me jump back just for a second so you might ask well how can there be 16 symptoms that sounds crazy but remember your entire body is now full of adrenaline cortisol and histamines each organ system is going to respond in its own way so for instance adrenaline shuts down the blood supply to the brain so you get constrictions in your brain, you relax, the vessels dilate, bam, you have a migraine. I had migraines since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. So it's your body's, so each organ responds in its own way. For instance, nerve conduction increases. That's why burning sensations throughout your body. I had skin rashes. Probably autoimmune disorders have a lot to do with this change in the body chemistry with the histamine levels, et cetera. So that's why there's so many symptoms that appear when your body's full of these chemicals in a sustained level. Mine are all gone. They're gone. Except, as my wife reminds me all the time, if I quit doing the exercises, which I'm going to teach you tonight, my symptoms come back in about two weeks. And that's what he discovered. He was not just telling you about pain. We're actually, he's actually Dr. Hansen's actually going to tell you the way he overcame and the way we, what we can do to also overcome whatever's going on. In your, but the journey then, what started you to realize it was not just a physical sensation that you had to deal with? What was that journey? Well, again, the key issue is I did have physical sensations, right? Yeah, you right? did, but... Right, but, it, and I had no idea why. Yeah. So it was by, really by pure luck I came out of this hole. I had no idea how I got into it. 
I had no idea how I came out of it. And what happened, I picked up a book in 1990, and this author said to start to do these writing exercises. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I started to write down thoughts and tear them up, just free writing. Then he wanted me to do this in a three-column technique, which I did. And after 15 solid years of diving deeper and deeper and deeper, things started to shift. By, by six weeks, things started to shift a lot. And then about six months later, we'll talk about anger in a second, about six months later when I hit my anger issues and started really decreasing the body's adrenaline, I was fine. After 15 solid years of being medically treated, in other words, we're mem we've medicalized a neurological problem. The neurological problem is what? The These memorized circuits in your brain. Okay. So you have the sustained response. By the way, let's talk about that just for a second. Yeah, no, please. So the problem with chronic pain or obsessive thought patterns is that you have this repetition of an impulse. It's like an athlete learning a skill. And with repetition, your brain simply learns a skill. So we now know within six to 12 months that if you have pain from any sort, you can start with an acute injury, but with repetition, it shifts to a different part of the brain and it becomes permanent. So it's like riding a bicycle. So you have this unconscious survival response that's now memorized, then the body gets sensitized and water torture is a classic example of just a drop of water that doesn't change. It's just a drop of water, right? But over time, it becomes intolerable because your brain gets focused on impulses with repetition. So your brain gets sensitized, then it memorizes the pain, then you're trapped. So when you're trapped, you become angry, which cranks up the body chemistry even higher. And so Dr. Sarno called it rage, and so when you're trapped now by your thoughts, you're trapped by physical symptoms, including pain, it's like holding your hand over a hot stove. You can't get it off. So your body gets really adrenalized, the symptoms get worse, you're more trapped, and it's a horrible, horrible cycle. Yeah. For most people, it's, there's no end to it. No e hope. Even with surgery, there's no. Surgery, surgery is for a structural problem that you can see. Right. This is a neurological problem in your brain <clears throat> and they're not connected. So let's talk about surgery just for a second. So I did surgery for eight years. I didn't do any surgery. I mean, I did surgery for what we call a structural problem. So I define a structural problem as if you can see the problem. In other words, a bone spur with matching symptoms, sciatica. And if you take away that bone spur, the, the pain goes away. It's very reliable. And I still do a lot of that. <clears throat> The data also shows that if you do even a, an appropriate surgery in the presence of chronic pain, that it won't work or make the pain worse up to 40% of the time. In other words, that part of the brain has already memorized pain. You start plugging in body parts. So we started to do what's called prehab on all of our surgical patients, where we got people sleeping better. We started working on these crazy circuits these, with some simple exercises. We worked on forgiveness letting go, less anger. We worked on physical conditioning in the gym. We would stabilize narcotics. We just did that for eight to 12 weeks before every surgical patient that had big bone spurs had major surgical lesions. They would come in for their final visit before surgery and they canceled the surgery because their pain disappeared. So this is, not about, this is not about managing pain. This is about having the pain literally disappear. In what percentage of the people that came in? I'm just curious. So first of all, if I can't see the problem, let's go to back pain for a second. Surgery's not a choice. So if you have a bone spur with sciatica, I'm just guesstimating with the prehab process, probably a third of patients cancel their surgery with major, major structural problems. Then the two thirds that we did the surgery on had spectacular results. And I used to tease my, I, I, I still do, I tease my fellows and I say, look, when was the last time you saw a surgical failure in my practice? And they go, we don't see it. Because the people that are angry and frustrated, they don't come back. And if you operate on somebody who's angry and frustrated, the chance of them doing well is very poor. And again, it's not psychological, you're just stirring up that hornet's nest with the trauma of surgery. The other thing we're finding out when people have had the bone spurs for years, all of a sudden they come in with a new symptom, we're finding out that situational stress is a big deal. People have horrible losses, suicides murders, divorces, financial losses, all those things create a tremendous amount of stress. So all of a sudden the body chemistry changes. 
that bone spur is the first thing to light up. And what I've learned simply ask the question, you know, what's going on? It takes about 90 seconds to figure out what's going on. And we just help them ride the situational stress out. Pain goes away. With this technique of writing, is that what you're saying? Well, two things. First of all, situ situational stresses, we also just help them write it out a bit. And then there's a technique called expressive writing that, again, there's not one research paper we talked about earlier that says spine surgery works for back pain, not one. Right. So before we go into expressive writing, can you give a little history of back pain, of surgery, because it, you said to me earlier, it sort of just started out of nowhere. Someone thought it was a good idea and, and it wasn't. To give us a little background on the history of back surgery. So it started in the 70s and 80s <clears throat> that a physician injected some dye into the disc of prisoners <clears throat> and felt that if the dye injection was painful, that that was the source of the pain. It's called a discogram. And I actually, I actually was in Hawaii training and watched us actually sweep from Australia to Hawaii to the mainland. And in 1997, they invented a new technology that helped obtain a fusion more reliably. The incidence of spine surgery for back pain went up 10 times. Spine incidence for spine surgery? Right, for back pain. Because suddenly there were more doctors who wanted to do that, really, is what you're saying. Right, right so the hypothesis was we have this degenerated disc, which is now painful, if we weld that disc together and get rid of the motion, we should get rid of the pain. So that's been going on still. The juggernaut continues. What's happened in the last five years, and by the way, I'm leaving my active spine surgery practice because of this. Instead of doing one and two level fusions that don't work, again, the success rate is about 20, 25%. We're now doing eight level fusions for back pain then not only do they not work, they actually really, really harm people. You're, they're fusing eight discs eight. in the spine? T10 to the pelvis, thoracic A 10 down to the pelvis. And it's not working? And how could they keep doing it if it's not working? That is exactly why I'm leaving my spine practice. Oh. I, can't, I honestly can't watch this anymore. It's really brutal. Right. And so you see people, and then it was hard. It's criminal. <clears throat> I mean, that's like... Um, I mean, I saw one woman who was a very active 65-year-old woman who had two months of thoracic back pain after lifting weights, muscular pain, right? They fused her from her neck to her pelvis. They did the operation wrong, they redid it. She ended up on high dose narcotics. She went from riding horses, playing golf, to being housebound, housebound high dose narcotics, and she went psychotic. This is after two months of lifting weights, 12 hours of surgery, had another 30-year-old kid who did not need surgery at all, paralyzed. Another guy, 45 years old, needed a one-level surgery, had one of these big operations. They lost six quarts of blood. He went blind, completely blind. So I'm seeing two or three patients every day in clinic who have had surgeries either recommended or done on normal spines, completely normal spines. How could they actually operate on a normal spine? How can they morally, I guess they do, what doctors? No, it's become, in the, in the business of medicine, we're having less time to talk to our patients, so we can't even ask the question, what's going on? And then the data is so clear, there are hundreds and hundreds of research papers that says sleep makes a difference. Just, for instance, there's a study out of Israel that shows that if you don't get sleep, it actually causes chronic pain. It's not the other way around. Major, major study. So again, the surgeons aren't even asking the question, well, how's your sleep? So that's where we come in, again, a discipline. So what's different about this approach is that this is not a solutions book, it's a concept book. So the three parts of solving chronic pain are, pain are you become aware of the problem, like anything in life. So you become aware of the neurological nature of pain you become aware of the diagnosis, which, what is your diagnosis. It's really critical to establish your diagnosis. And I work up patients more than I used to because I want to create an awareness of what's going on. Well, can you give examples? So let's take the first one, um, you know, become aware. So right. what, what would you become aware of? So first of all, simply understanding pain. Okay. Tell us. So again, remember, pain is an output. It's not an input. In other words, in other words the input is all these sensations your body processes, your body summarizes all that input and says, this is uncomfortable. So that's a neurological construct. 
So then we know pain's affected by lots of other aspects, like lack of sleep increases pain. When you're triggered by a family member, we know that neurons that fire together wire together. The event research shows that when a couple gets triggered, the person in pain has the pain go through the ceiling, right? So it's just a simple trigger. Again, that's a neurological issue. So you become aware of the neurological nature of pain. You become aware of what triggers it. You become aware of the tools to help decrease the body's adrenaline and decrease, decrease the response. Tools. Right. Being so it's a, this is about a 90% self-directed process. You do not need a major pain clinic to do this at all. This is very self-directed. What are the tools then? So the first step is called expressive writing. So remember I said there's not one research paper that says that surgery works for back pain. Not one. Not one? Not one. That and by 2020, they're estimating, estimating there'll be almost a million spine fusions done a year in the United States. Almost a million. So the first, so this step called expressive writing is going to be write down your thoughts, you tear them up. There's almost a thousand research papers now that says that it works. In, in, in my own experience, within two weeks after I started the writing, things started to shift. So you, you were in pain, or someone's in pain, let's say anyone, or we're all in pain, and we write down our thoughts about what? Anything, just free writing, positive or negative, rational or irrational, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you have to write out, I'm angry at this person or that. So you can. And, and okay, so that's the first, and then you rip it up? Is that your? Right, and you rip it up for two reasons. One of them is to write with freedom. Remember, you can't escape your thoughts. This is the most critical part. If you did only one thing tonight, please, Take note of this. You can't escape your thoughts. We all agree on that, right? But what the writing does is separate you. So the thoughts are here, you're here. You have a space. That space is now connected with vision and feel, which is part of the unconscious brain. So the way you redirect your brain is awareness, separation, redirecting or reprogramming. The writing does the awareness and separation in one step. The reason why you tear them up is to write with freedom, number one. But the second thing is to not analyze them. Because what, what happens when you analyze them? Well, you keep going back and probably creating more pain. Right, so all these issues come up, right, on this piece of paper, they're not issues. They're just thoughts. So you tear them up to not analyze them. And one of my pain colleagues said really simply that you, know, you hold on to your pieces of paper. A lot of people don't want to tear these thoughts up. You hold on to your pain. So you, you tear it up and do you burn it and throw it away? <laughs> well, you really have to shred it, burn it, tear it up. I mean, you really want to write with freedom. There's a few patients, I would have to call it maybe aggressive, aggressive behavior where they have written them down, not torn them up. And of course, they've spewed off at their spouse and they want their spouse to find them. That's not the way to do it. So that's only the first step is writing your thoughts. Correct. Okay, and then... But it's the, only, it's the only one step that's necessary. Everything else is completely optional. Would you say to do that every day, whether you're in pain or not? Do you have anxiety? Um, probably. Let me check. Yeah. yeah. Remember, anxiety is the pain, right? So if I quit writing, I mean, it's just my day's better. It's like three to five minutes. That's it. That's in the it. morning or at night? At morning. Doesn't matter. Probably once or twice a day. They've also there's one research paper shows that you simply do your writing at night. It helps you fall asleep quite a bit faster. And again, sleep is also a huge factor in chronic pain. So there's a bunch of steps in the book about how to deal with sleep. Mm -hmm. So the writing is, does awareness and separation. And then the next step I'll just do right now, this second, is that everybody just feel where you're sitting. Just drop your shoulders for a second. I call it active meditation. We actually do this in surgery to help calm things down. So what happens, I call it active meditation, create an awareness, a separation, and then you redirect. So what you're doing with active meditation or an abbreviated, abbreviated mindfulness is you're simply switching sensory input. So instead of doing battle with these thoughts, you simply switch sensations. Anybody hear that little sound over there? The little air duct sound? So drop your shoulders. The second step is let it stabilize. You relax, stabilize, and pick a sensation. So just relax. Let that stabilize. And listen to that air duct sound. And then feel where you're sitting. Let your jaw muscles relax. 
Shoulders relax. Elbows, hands. And just listen to sounds. Just listen to that air duct sound. Did anybody feel a little relaxed on that? Did anybody hear my voice drop a little bit? Okay, so it's, I call it active meditation because you can do that. I do it with my patients all day long because it slows me down. So the principles of solving chronic pain is you decrease the body's adrenaline and stress chemicals, which drops the anxiety. Okay, once you, remember, anxiety is that feeling generated by the body's chemistry being unpleasant. So once you readjust the body's chemistry, anxiety drops. So what you did here is that you simply dropped your adrenaline levels a little bit. But you also switched sensory input from thoughts to a different sensation or from pain to a different sensation. So instead of doing battle with these unsolvable circuits, you simply switch sensory input. So the brain's very neuroplastic, which is much different than I was taught in medical school. So your brain's changing every second. So you can't control the unconscious response, but you can redirect traffic to start developing your brain over here. One of the other rules that we give people on the first visit is do the writing exercises, combine it with active meditation. But the other one, which has been very, very profound in the last couple of years, is simply never discuss your pain, ever, with anybody. So if you're my patient, you're in my office, Yeah. I'm saying, Alan, right. when you walk out the door of this office, you will never discuss your pain ever again. To anyone? Anybody okay. except your doctor. That's uh, it. It's okay to tell you. You can tell, me, you can tell your physical therapist for a second. But, and what is the reason for that? Where's your attention? On my pain, of course. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to... Right, ever, so you're... But you don't want to ignore it either. Or you do. You're, well, you, you're you pretty, do. it's pretty hard to ignore it. Right. So you're going to acknowledge it, feel it, and simply switch directions. So if you want to fight it, where's your attention? I'm fighting my pain. Right. One of the bad prognostic factors for dealing with chronic pain is belonging to a pain support group. So we can all talk about right. our pain together. Right. So it's, it's, I didn't understand this, and, and I'm, I'll admit I'm guilty as charged myself. I mean, when I was in the worst part of my chronic pain experience, I was becoming an epiphany addict. I mean, it's always looking for that next one answer to solve my problem. Mm -hmm. And I won't ask the question to the audience because I don't know you at all, but you're talking about your pain all the time. I had no idea how much people did talk about their pain a lot. And also, and also say no complaining. Don't Period. complain. Right. And my wife mm -hmm. pulled this one on me about five years ago, and I didn't understand at the moment. But I have all these legitimate concerns at work, and my people treat me badly, and whatever it was. I come home and I would share that with my wife. She says, stop. And she, I, did, I honestly didn't understand at the time what was going on, but she was right. Is that, again, remember, anxiety is the pain. So if your boss is treating you badly, why do you want to bring that home? You have to do, I mean, but you just have to write it down. I mean, that's, that's how you release it because people Absolutely. release it by talking about it. And, right. But you're saying, just write it. They've also done research showing that you can do it verbally. You can go into a quiet room by yourself. Actually, look in the mirror if you have the courage to do this. It's a little humbling, but complain to the mirror. Really? It, 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 I wouldn't it, want to yeah. listen to <laughs> that person's It's sort of a sobering experience because you're, it, honestly, when I was going through my deal, this person, David Burns, who wrote the book Feeling Good, said, stand in front of a mirror and complain. So you can do verbal expressive writing. It's quite effective because you've externalized the thoughts. Just don't do it on the subway, and then they'll right. go on. No, go ahead. I, I actually had be, in the, I used to do it driving. It's sort of a bad idea. <laughs> so I don't, I don't do it driving anymore because you do really get caught up in these thoughts. But yeah, you can verbally express your thoughts in a quiet room by yourself with freedom. Don't have to tear those up. And it works quite well. How did you actually discover, when you started this, were you totally shocked by this? Writing, discovering, in your case? Totally. I mean, I thought at the time it was the book. It was a, it's a great book. It's called Feeling Good by David Burns. It is an excellent book. So I thought that the three-column technique was the answer. It turns out that it's a great technique, but it's the writing. So it doesn't matter. 
and most of the research been, has been done on negative writing, and it turns out it doesn't matter. It could be any writing at all, positive or negative. You can complain in your writing about things. Absolutely. Okay. Just checking. But even, even positive thoughts, remember they're just thoughts. And so, for instance, we, I don't know how deep you want to go. The, go I know we're we talking about a way. They're, they're a deep crowd here. Yeah. So the thing is, <clears throat> so what all of us do as human beings, we are a product of our past, right? So if you say something unkind to me that resembles something that was said to me 20 years ago, my brain responds to 20 years ago, not necessarily to you right now. And maybe I don't know who you are, but in my mind, you're that person 20 years ago. So we're constantly projecting our viewpoint of the world onto people right in front of us. Anytime you judge somebody positively or negatively, you've lost awareness. You put your label of that person on, you, you, in other words, you put your concept of reality onto that person or situation. So what happens is an endless projecting in my brain onto you of my view of the world. So as you start going through the process of writing and separating, you start becoming aware with the first step of becoming aware of your labels. So I labeled you as X, you seem like a great guy. Well, I don't know that. I mean, you could be a con man. I mean, how do I know, right? So I talked to you beforehand, seems like a really nice guy, I would consider hiring you if I could, or whatever. So, okay, but, I, but see, this is all based on my interpretation of sensory input right now. So, okay, I have this good guy label on you, or I have a patient walks in off the street, drug addict, who which, by the way, is 40% of my entire practice right now is drug, drug addiction. Opioids. Yeah, it's a whole different topic, but it's all related to this. So I realize I've labeled that person, but the first step of becoming aware is becoming aware of the labels, right? So then I try, then I try to find out who's this human being. So it's a big difference saying this person's a drug addict as opposed to saying this person has a problem with drugs, right? So who's this person the human being behind the drugs. Unfortunately, in medicine, our culture is pretty prone to label and be judgmental. And uh, I'm guessing those of you who have been in chronic pain have been bounced around, you've been labeled, you can't, quote, find anything wrong, so you get labeled, which doesn't feel very good, right? Which gets you more trapped and more frustrated. So they call it medically unexplained symptoms, the body's full of stress chemicals are completely medically explained symptoms. Not to get into too deep, but by you in, implying that the opioid epidemic is because people don't know how to deal with their pain, and they're just suppressing their total body sensations and creating addictions and all this um, awful things we hear about. The data shows that 87% of people on opioids have chronic pain. So restricting access to drugs, that's not gonna work. Right? If you're in chronic pain, you're going to go after the drug no matter what. I have an endless number of people who have been on oral medications, pretty high dose, and all of a sudden the doctors cut off the medications. What are you going to do? You're going to go right to the street. And, and all of us would. So don't think any of you are above doing that because if you need your drugs, you're going to get them. Second of all, what's happened since my non-operative care has become so effective... Non-operative care meaning the... the no, my non-operative care will mean this whole project we're talking about. In other words, if I can, if you're my patient, I'm going to rehab the heck out of you. Whether I do surgery or don't do surgery, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get you to pain-free, or you are, right? It's a self-directed process. So it turns out I take call, and there's a massive epidemic of IV drugs. What happens is the bacteria get into the bloodstream. They lodge into the spine. They get into the disk space, and they can't get out. So you have like, it's like a little cancer that, growing. That creates the pain. It creates a huge hole in the spine. And so I ended up doing massive spine surgery to try to solve the problem. People become paralyzed. They develop bacteria on their heart valves. It goes to their brain. I mean, really bad stuff happens when you have IV, IV drugs in the blood. So 40% of my entire practice is from taking care of IV drug addicts. So I get to talk to them a lot. The pain they're trying to escape is the mental pain. It's not the physical pain. Second of all, nobody really wants to be a drug addict. It's not their first choice, right? So, but the mental pain is extreme. And one part of the story I t I've told a fair amount, but I don't share it a huge amount, is that I was suicidal. You, it's because of your pain? Well, the mental pain. Uh -huh. I mean, here I am, this major spine surgeon, 
having crippling anxiety that was relentless. And when I asked my patients, look, if I could get rid of your physical pain or your mental pain, which one do you want to get rid of? And invariably, it's the mental pain. Mm -hmm. So with the opioid, the opioid addiction, they're actually, this process actually is the answer. It's self-directed. So between the book and the website, this is about 90% self-directed. And so it can be put out there on a widespread basis. basis. It can be put right into the elementary school system. I mean, how hard is it to start writing when you're in first grade? It seems so simple. It seems too easy. I mean, it seems... I well, mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah. So you come to me for major spine surgery, and, you, and it's interesting because the biggest obstacle of getting better is that people actually don't want to give up their pain. They, get a t they become identified. They become right? addicted to their pain, but it's also a powerful tool. So pain manipulates people around you. People have less expectations of you. You have less expectations of yourself. And then when you're in this victim role, it's a very powerful feeling, which is the opposite of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So one of the basic ways we disguise anxiety is we're frustrated, perfectionistic, self-judgmental, that all disguises anxiety, but also fires up the nervous system. Right. But you also talk about control. Back in, so where does control fit into all this? You can't control most of your circumstances, but you have a choice of your response. So you can control how you, you can respond. Right. Okay. And you've heard this, I mean, it's been known for millennium, actually, in Buddhism. And you can correct me on this one. <laughs> okay. But pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional, right? That's what they say. Right. And so that suffering comes from the anxiety, right? When you start putting on, this, putting on the stories, the layers of stories on the initial unpleasant input, you develop extreme anxiety. That's where the suffering really occurs is this relentless anxiety. In my experience, I may have some bad knees. They hurt actually in some ways more than my back did at the worst that it did. But I don't, I don't have anxiety. So it's just pain. But this relentless anxiety was absolutely unspeakably intolerable. They call it the abyss. So going back to the drug addiction issue, we're fighting the wrong war. So the war is against mental pain, is against chronic pain, incredibly easily implemented, self-directed solutions. And again, there's a certain point in IV drug addiction that you, you honestly can't come back. Because what happens is that you become angry and frustrated. That's part of the disease that blocks the treatment. But I'm just guessing I've had, I don't know, maybe a fourth of the people with severe IV drug issues come off the drugs and stay off of them. Through this technique of writing. Well, and everything else that goes along with it. So the writing mm. is just a starting point. And then, again, this awareness, separation, reprogramming. So reprogramming includes good food, good wine, good friends, re-engaging with family and friends, not talking about the pain. And one thing I really do want to talk about really quickly yeah, that is actually the ultimate solution to chronic pain is play. Play, playing. Right, not just obsessive play to distract yourself, but a playful attitude. And that's the way the human brain developed was with play, you know, kittens play, dogs play, big animals play, even small creatures play humans as kids play and that's how you it's a three-dimensional way of developing your brain mm. and so there's a book out called play by Stuart Brown who's done he's a psychiatrist who spent his entire life researching play and the way you really develop a very solid base for dealing with life is play because you try things out they work or they don't work but it's a low stakes game right mm -hmm. so my wife and I and daughter do a workshop at Omega which we'll be doing this weekend that's why I'm here in New York it's a three-day workshop based on awareness, hope, forgiveness, and play. And Babs does the cup song, Rhythm. My daughter does some relaxation tools, do lots of sharing. But it turns out that in a structured environment where people can share experiences and simply share, within 12 hours after people start to really just laugh, it is ridiculous. I'm not, I'm, I gotta be the worst cup song person in the world. I mean, I didn't really train in spine surgery to, to do the cup song, right? That the, was the, what? The, the cup song. Anybody the cup, know the cup song? No, I don't think so. I'm not going to do that right now. You want to do it now? No, I don't uh, want to do that right now. Okay. <laughs> You're not no, that just, No, my, wife, my, wife's a, <laughs> my wife's a professional tap dancer, so we're not going to tap dance at Omega, but um, there's this little hand rhythm called the cup song, and I think Miss New York won Miss New York doing the cup song, right? Was 
Does anybody remember that? Anyway, no. a couple years ago, Miss New York did the cup song. Anyway, it's just a silly hand rhythm, and people are fumbling around, cups are flying around the table, and people start to laugh. Uh -huh. Within 12 to 24 hours after people start to relax at that level and share, 80% of the entire group goes to pain-free, which was completely, totally unexpected. I did not expect that one. Well, so we'll take a few questions. I mean, some of this, I'm, I'm sure people have some questions because someone must be in pain out there. Oh, you have a, yes. Dan has you. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I have uh, disc degeneration in my C5, C6, and you're saying basically I created that? So all discs degenerate with age, even at a relatively young age. And also what's happened, the MRI scan came out in the 1980s, and it's based on water content. It's based on hydrogen ion. So as you lose water content, the disc becomes darker, we call it degenerate, degenerated disc. The research in the 1990s shows whether it's disc degeneration, which is normal, or bulging disc, rupture disc, herniated disc, arthritis, none of those have been correlated with neck pain, thoracic pain, or back pain, zero. We actually know that. That's been documented very clearly that disc degeneration causes stiffness at that segment because there's less water in the segment. That's it. Are you in pain? Um, so I have some radiating pain in my neck, my jaw, my back, right. my lower back as well. Yeah, I mean, you're a wonderful candidate for this process. And I, I want to be really clear here. So I think Alan knows this, but I'm not here to sell you the best thing since sliced bread. It's better than sliced bread, and I didn't invent this. This book represents mainstream medicine. These treatments have been documented in hundreds of research papers. There's a paper out of Baltimore that shows that only 10% of surgeons are actually acknowledging this data before they do surgery. I wrote a paper about three years ago, a review article looking at the different factors that affect pain. There are hundreds and hundreds of research papers that says sleep makes a difference. The writing exercises have been documented, again, in a thousand research papers. The forgiveness, a lot of research on forgiveness, because when you're holding on to anything in the past, which we all do, Guess what happens to your body's chemistry? Cranks it up. When you increase the adrenaline, you increase the nerve conduction by double. You double the nerve conduction. So all of a sudden, you get sensations happening that, shouldn't normally, that would not normally be happening. So again, what you're doing to solve chronic pain is you're decreasing the body's chemistry, and you're changing the neurological response, neurological response with neuroplasticity and rerouting the pathways. And just guesstimate, within three to six months after after you start the process, things start to change dramatically. And it's consistent. And so the book is a framework that outlines proven medical treatments in a way that you can direct your own care. That's the whole key to this thing. But yeah, you'd be a wonderful candidate for this. So you would tell her to start writing three to five minutes every day, whatever your thoughts, and rip so, them up. Yeah, I'll just give you, give you your homework. I mean, again, jump on the website first before you jump onto the book, and you just go to stage one. And there's the writing exercises called expressive writing. Then that little act of meditation exercise, you can just do that right now. Just feel where you're standing. And then the fifth one, again, which is interesting, is simply don't discuss your pain ever. Don't complain. And it's remarkable how much difference that makes. I mean, one thing I'm doing right now, I ask people not to watch the news. Why? I mean, you're, you're putting this, you, when you get upset about something that you have no control over, you're sitting there getting adrenalized, and what are you going to do? So paradoxically, when you're, I mean, I'm saying read the headlines and understand it, but for whatever reasons, you start watching the news a lot, you're sitting there getting really adrenalized, you're not going to feel very good. So paradoxically, you've taken yourself out of circulation to actually help solve the problem. And I think if I heard the mission statement, this whole reason this whole process is here is to improve the collective consciousness. So I think... Right? Yeah, the assemblage is here, I think, for that reason. Yeah, so paradoxically, you're letting go of things you have no control over. And Dr. Luskin, in, in his book out of Stanford called Forgive for Good, pointed out that if you get upset about something you have no control over, he calls it the unenforceable rules, and you're wasting your time, right? So if you really want to contribute to the human consciousness, you just let it go. Are you going to do it? Um, yeah, basically, the underlying message is um, don't 
be attached to the outcome or to your thoughts, your actions? Absolutely. Again, but it's a somatic exercise because you, you can intellectually know that, but it's a million to one mismatch. So the writing is a physical separation process. And then, for instance, Dr. Luskin pointed out forgiveness. Every day I go into the victim mode. And so his point was it's a process. Anytime you're anxious or frustrated, you've been triggered. And so you become aware of the triggers. And as you become aware of that, you start, you start calming down consistently. And with repetition, your brain physically changes structure. And the pain really does disappear. It's shocking. I mean, I'm a surgeon. I still think like a surgeon. And people come in pain-free all the time. And that's what's making me harder, it's making it harder for me now to stay in spine surgery because I'm watching people get better consistently within three to six months with no cost, no risk, no interventions. And they're going through a $100,000 spine operation that destroys their life. Wow. Huh? Question, oh, did you have, you have a question here? Okay. Yeah, give me a second, my back's a little sore. No, I was, I was just thinking when she said, you know, she was diagnosed with this um, disc degeneration. When I was like 20 years old, I went to an orthopedist with knee pain, and he said, oh, look at your x-ray, you have early de degenerative arthritis, and um, if you continue dancing, it'll get worse, so you should just try something that doesn't involve the body. And that, it had a very big impact. And I think, and now with MRI scans, I mean, you don't even know what you're looking at, but the doctor is saying, look at these discs. And that is creating a huge thought process. Because, uh, so I went, to, I was living in Berkeley. I went to, I went to a healer. I went to the, you know, the extreme opposite and she said, you know, first of all, throw out that coffee right now. And I want you to eat um, okra and drink oat straw tea. And my problem was, I thought that was, that was interesting, but I kept thinking about the x-ray that this doctor showed me. And I mean, m I chose to just start dancing every day, doing ballet, so developing. What so I, I, I didn't listen to the doctor. But I'm just saying that everybody in this room gets diagnosed and it, it's a, it's, it becomes this huge, you know, label. And no, there is something wrong with me. I definitely have a disc or I, I had scoliosis when I was 17 years old and that's why I have pain now. And it's, it's a complete myth. She, she hasn't listened to this doctor either. Oh, this, this is... Well, that's my wife, by the way. Yes, that's his wife. Well, Dan, what do you think about all this? Because you, you had I, some. I mean, I think this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually had an interesting experience recently where I felt sore in my back, and I felt how it was how I identify myself in a weird way. Like I saw it was almost part of my character, not part of my body. It was very and then you switched it and no more pain? Yeah, and then I realized that I don't need to do that. Yeah. Right. For lots of people, just awareness it's interesting, there's a study out, of, study out of Australia that shows that simply understanding chronic pain, the pain drops down 80% within 12 months, just knowing the problem. You had a question back there? So many questions, but I will try to be brief. Um, it, it, it's a really interesting subject because I grew, my father's a chiropractor, so I watched a lot of people come into his practice with back pain, including myself, many, many times. Um, and he, he, he would be, I wish you could be here today. He, he would be running up and kissing you uh, right now for what you're doing. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, but the heart of my question relates to uh, an unfortunate situation with a brother uh, who was paralyzed about two years ago. T11, uh, fall from about 25 feet, broke his spine in half, um, and suffers with chronic pain. I was trying to get him to go to your workshop in Rhinebeck, but it's just logistics are not going to work out. So I was curious, have you had any success... Uh, now, uh, with, we're working with people who have been paralyzed or even quadriplegics um, because they, you know, a lot of them do still have this kind of residual chronic pain that what you're saying or what I think you're saying is that the acute part of the, the accident, the trauma, is real, but then the response is learned because he has weaned himself off opioids. 
Um, and he uses occasional marijuana to try to manage his pain. But I'm curious if you've had any success working with people with that kind of acute level trauma. Yeah, I mean, we also have people with MS, Parkinson's, um, all sorts of other neuro neurological issues, strokes, et cetera. And, and, and the problem with paraplegia, of course, they get spasms, which can be exactly horrible, right. So they get horrible spasms, et cetera. So the answer is you can dramatically decrease the symptoms by using the tools. And again, well-established medical tools. So writing relaxation, he's probably not a very happy guy right now. No, his marriage is falling apart and his yeah, whole life so is Yeah, so what happens, he's a true victim. So the victim of being angry is circumstance, blame, victim, anger, right? And the problem, again, he's helpless in a way, right? He's not, he doesn't have the life he wants or wanted or had. But also, I'm just guessing in this room, is sort of human nature to always focus on what you don't have. So we all, we all find reasons to remain angry. And what we have in the medical world is perfectionism. We're never perfect. So we're a victim of less than perfect. And then we're always frustrated about being less than perfect. So as you start calming down the nervous system, deal with the anger aspect of his situation, then it changes the body's chemistry. The spasms start to drop down dramatically. So again, I'll say this again. I actually don't like to say this sentence because it, tri it triggers people, but all the pain's real. I mean, the only place pain is interpreted is in your brain. So remember, it's sensory input. Pain is an output. Pain is an interpretation of sensory input that says, protect me. I gotta take protective action to solve, my, to keep myself safe. So well, that's the crazy part. Excuse me for interrupting you, but the uh, with paralysis, he shouldn't be feeling this input. That's what's so crazy, right? Right. But remember, the mental pain is actually worse than the physical pain. In other words, you're angry, frustrated, and trapped. Life is not great, right? So, and I keep reminding yeah. my patients. I mean, think about this carefully. Is that if you had no pain, and, and life was good as far as no pain but you're incredibly angry going through a divorce, obsessively angry, or a boss, or, or circumstances, whatever, your life is not great. Your quality of life is not good when you're in a sustained, agitated state. Again, it goes to the same part of the brain as the physical pain. So if you took that part of his load off of his brain just by going through the acceptance process, which is not easy, this is not easy stuff, but it's doable, the quality of his life would improve dramatically. So let's take away the anger part of his situation. First of all, the nerve conduction would, would improve and the pain would drop down, but he also could engage or re-engage in meaningful relationships. And the reason why play is so powerful is that you can't solve chronic pain. It's these permanent embedded circuits, but you separate and redirect. It's like moving a river to a different channel. So play, spiritual journey, perspective, that's the solution to chronic pain. In other words, you, you creativity, getting a whole part of your brain back that gets buried. That's why we ask people not to discuss their pain because it pulls them right back into that hole. So, yeah, he has the, and again, yeah, let's talk about, you know, my wife reminded me, phantom limb pain is classic where you have, you know, the arm or leg is amputated and you still feel the, still feel the limb and you still feel the pain. Okay, it's gone. And ever since I was a medical student, I'm going, what? But it's become really clear, the neuroscience now shows, that that part of the brain is lit up. So if I turn a light switch on, that light's on, not at the switch, but at the light. So the part of my brain that goes to my neck is on. The neck hurts, it's not the brain, right? People forget that, for instance, when you smell something or see something, there's nothing inherent in your eyes that says that's a chair or that's a carpet or that's a couch. Your brain has to unscramble the signals. For instance, if you have a, a occipital stroke, which where the vision center is in your brain, you can't see. I mean, your eyes are working perfectly fine, but you can't see, right? Your brain has to unscramble the signals. So all of input is always interpreted by the brain, including right. pain. Pleasure, pain, the whole it's thing. It's all interpretation. It's just signals, and we do something with it. Right, and it's also just a unit. I mean, modern medicine, to separate the mind versus the body is insane. I mean, think about trying to fly a Boeing 747 without a computer. How's that going to work? I, I've never tried that, so I know. <laughs> no. But, okay, one more question. Anybody? Uh, Jonathan, you have a question? No? Oh, what, you have one over, over there. Um, Forrest. Oh, uh, oh, let's. 
But what, what can we do with so, 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 what, so one, one, final thought, one final thought on the workshop. So I do ask people to read the book and have been engaged in the website with the writing for probably a good four to six weeks before the workshop. Because the workshop's an experience. You're trying to actually experience what it's like to feel safe and pain free. So you'll see pretty quickly when you read the book, it'll take two or three times through it to get your head around this stuff. Because it's not very hard, but it's backwards. This is a letting go, not a fixing process. So the workshop's intended to experience being safe. Because when you're in chronic pain, you're not safe because your body's attacking you with pain impulses. That's the right. antithesis of feeling safe. So the workshop, we do it, we'll probably be doing a lot more after I leave active spine surgery practice. Mm -hmm. But right now, if he wants to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to him, by the way. But, okay, Forrest, and then a we'll quick one over here. Forrest, did you have a question, Forrest? Yeah, we have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, did someone have a question? They could, yeah. they could John, John take Jonathan had a question, but what did you have? Oh, I'll, I'll right, you can give it to Jonathan Bricklin, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I thought you had a question, but, but, all right. Um, I, lo I love everything you've been saying. I'm just, it seems like the back pain now is a real candidate for the placebo effect, and I wonder if you have any comment on that. So placebo is the most powerful drug that exists in the universe. There's nothing more powerful than placebo. So I'm sorry that it's got a bad name to it, because what you're doing, in fact, so what all you're doing is simply harnessing your body's capacity to heal. So wounds heal faster, um, cardiac arrhythmias are changed with placebo. So what you're doing, the essence of the solution, by the way, is you're connecting to your own body's capacity to heal. That's why this is not a how-to book. This is a concept book, and you'll find your own solution by connecting to who you are and your capacity to heal. Also in the workshop, we also found out that humans, basically people heal each other. I don't do much. I mean, people, as you share an experience with another human being, it starts to wake up a part of your brain that's actually enjoyable, social, et cetera. And so the but word placebo, unfortunately, has got, gotten a bit of a bad name, but it is by far and away the most powerful drug that exists. Well, thank you all here today. Um, Dr. Hanskin's book, Back in Control, The Surgeon's Roadmap, Out of Chronic Pain. Did you have something to say? Yeah. Well, yeah, please feel free to get a hold of me by email or whatever, Beth, or the, um, we can get a hold of me. Because I, I really honestly went through a horrible experience, and we, to watch somebody have no hope go absolutely pain-free is incredibly rewarding. So it's just, it's been a remarkable phase of my career that I really have enjoyed. Well, thank you for your work and the courage to stand up in front of doctors and say, we have another way. This is not working. So, I mean, that's, that's heroic in this culture. So thank you for being here. Thank the assemblage. Thank you. And my name's Alan Steinfeld. Look up New Realities. Thank you, Just One. And it's always great to be here. And see you next time. Thank you.